Sorry? It's still 4 o'clock. Okay. okay. 4 o'clock is when we'll start, basically, Very I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and Carl, did you, you hear that they've given us permission to go over 60 minutes if we want right. to? Right. Right. So if there are questions, it's like this, we can yeah. allow some questions. We'll questions. see who drifts out of the room. Right. 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 I hope. Uh, Hope we get our Indian participant. Yeah. Do you want to send him a note while I'm introducing? Or uh, it's maybe too late. Um, you may may, maybe. Him. Yeah, maybe. Okay. So. I missed lunch. <laughs> me, me too, but it's. But I'm, uh, well, I'm somehow okay. Yeah. I hope I don't get. Uh, start, but you could leave the door open. Oh, okay. You're right. Something breaks down. Okay. okay. Should I turn it on or not? Okay. For, uh, for joining us. Uh, you had us worried a little bit that we were only going to have five people in the room uh, until the, uh, the plenary session or whatever was uh, left off, and so we're, we're happy to see you. Of course, the, um, our challenge is that, uh, that uh, the organizers, in their wisdom, put the two gene editing things at the same time, uh, so uh, we may be able to get together with them at some point right afterwards maybe and, and, uh, and have a chat and see what they learned and what we learned here. So, uh, uh, what, um, uh, yeah, my name's Carl Prey. I'm from Rutgers University and with uh, Rob Parlberg, we helped organize this, this session. And uh, uh, I guess Rob was in charge of, of the title. So the title was Will Gene Editing crops be kept from farmers. And really what we're trying to do is figure out, uh, uh, you know, what's, what is the promise of gene editing and maybe why we don't see it in the field uh, yet uh, and uh, what, what uh, may be coming down the pike. And the difference between our session and, and uh, the other session is that ours is going to be more focused on uh, the, the international arena uh, and what's going on in in India and Africa and Europe and uh, China. And so uh, we hope to give you an international perspective and then we will um, uh, have some time for uh, some questions and it turns out that, that if we want, we can go on beyond our, our one hour and, uh, and continue discussions. Um, so, um, Let's see, can I turn this? Uh, yes. So um, uh, let me see where I can see this. Uh, so uh, I've been sort of uh, trying to understand uh, CRISPR and uh, its implications for plant breeding, and, and I have to uh, put in this caveat to begin with that 
that I'm an agricultural economist who dabbles in uh, biotechnology and stuff like that, and, and so uh, I am uh, sometimes easily fooled, I think, by, uh, by the excitement of the biologists with some new technology, and I get on board, and, but then I have to try to figure out what's going on here. And so, so this session is to educate me as well as to educate others, and, and I really hope that, that the people that really know what's going on with CRISPR will jump in when I go wrong or, or when the, the panel goes wrong. So uh, my sense is that, that CRISPR has uh, turned out to be a very useful uh, uh, technique to improve plant breeding, be it, uh, in quotes, conventional plant breeding or, or um, the, uh, you know, breeding GMOs. Uh, and, and it's used very extensively in labs throughout the world uh, as um, a research tool, which is, is basically what it is. Um, but so far, uh, as you well know, very little is, has uh, made its way to farmers. Uh, and so our, the question we're going to puzzle out a bit is, is why not? And um, uh, part of the answer clearly uh, is the, the um, regulations and policies uh, may well have uh, slowed down the, the spread of uh, cultivars that, that could be uh, very useful. Um, but, um, and, it, and it also, we'll also talk about the fact that some of the regulations have finally been put in place so that people know how to, uh, uh, the breeders and others know how they can work it through the system, uh, which wasn't the case uh, until recently. Um, and, uh, but the, my puzzle, one of my puzzles is that, that the U.S. and Argentina have had a fairly clear regulatory pathway in place now for about, um, well, since about uh, 2015. Uh, and, and yet the only uh, variety that we actually see in the, in the field from gene editing is the, the improved quality soybean that was not developed by CRISPR, but it was uh, developed using uh, talents. And so the, one of the questions is, how much is it due to regulation? How much is it due to the technology really not being quite ready for, for prime time, I guess? Um, so, whoops, did I go the wrong way? Or? Uh, one more. Uh, can I get the next slide? Uh, so, uh, just to, uh, to to frame things before we go into the rest of the world, I did uh, put together a few numbers um, on what's actually going on with CRISPR, and also I've kind of highlighted in yellow uh, some of the things that that are similar about um, who's involved with biotech, uh, with uh, CRISPR, yeah. Um, and uh, so that's what's, what's in yellow. These are things that are common with the GMOs in some sense. Um, but the, the thing that's interesting about um, the uh, technologies that have been approved by um, the, not approved, so to speak, but are in a sense deregulated um, by uh, USDA, APHIS, uh, are, are quite interesting in the sense that they're, they're, uh, the, the, the biggest one is, is canola, in fact, in the terms of numbers of, of um, uh, varieties, gene-edited varieties that are in the pipeline, um, followed by soybeans, potatoes, tomatoes, pennycrest, um, a green manure, and then maize. So it's not the, the big crop so much as it is uh, a number of, of other crops that are uh, playing a, a much bigger role in terms just of the numbers of traits that have been uh, deregulated by uh, USDA. Um, and the other thing that's, that's interesting is that, that many of the traits or the main traits that you see are uh, for product quality um, or uh, longer shelf life, uh, then followed by pest resistance um, and uh, growth habit and yield improvement. Uh, the leading companies in order of the number of, of permits are 
Cebus, Cybus, I don't know how to pronounce it, um, followed by uh, Simplot, Potatoes, um, and then you get into the, the big companies that have been involved with uh, GMOs, which is uh, Corteva, followed by a whole series of other varieties like this Yield 10 Biosciences, uh, Inami, and, and uh, several, a Brazilian, uh, no, uh, Argentine company. So it's quite a, a different um, setup from uh, what we'd see with GMOs. Um, and the other place that's had the similar kind of, of uh, long period of, of deregulation or of, of regulatory uh, systems that are ready to go is Argentina. And there, again, you see the, the crop mix is, is somewhat similar to, uh, to um, the uh, GMOs, but um, there's no uh, cotton varieties. Corn and soybeans are the largest, uh, like GMOs. But fruits, vegetables, ornamentals are, are much, um, much more important than with GMOs. And uh, in terms of quality traits, or, or the traits, the health benefits for consumers is one of the lar largest categories, then followed by herbicide tolerance and some others. And 9% um, of the gene-edited crops were by multinationals opposed to 90% of the, the, uh, the uh, GMOs. So we have quite a different uh, pattern, um, and uh, this, is, this is one of the things that I think uh, is, is intriguing, and um, we'll see how uh, our panelists uh, look at things in the rest of the, the world. Um, so we're going to go in, in this order, uh, you know, talking about the regulations and how they've evolved, um, and then perhaps uh, getting some comments of, of um, are these uh, regulations actually slowing down the spread of the, the gene edited crops and uh, whether there really are um, technology issues that still have yet to be worked out. So we're going to start with Rob Parlberg, who is an associate of the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard. Uh, it'll be followed by Eustace Wessler. Um, who's a professor of agricultural economics at Wageningen, uh, and then Margaret Karembu, uh, director of ISA's African Center. And then we hope um, Anjan from uh, Mahiko will be joining us uh, online. And we have uh, Jikun Huang, finally, who's a professor at uh, Peking University, talking about the Chinese regulatory system. Um, and so I think um, uh, just a couple of uh, issues of thanks. Uh, thanks to Rob for really um, being behind this uh, organizational session, organizing the session, the Borlaug Dialogue for um, advancing us to whatever level of panel we are right now um, and uh, saving us a few bucks. And then um, uh, thanks to our speakers for, for coming, particularly uh, Margaret, who um, has had to jump through many hurdles and over, you know, and, and <laughs> but, but she's, she's here and, uh, and we're very happy that you could, could make it. And then thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, so Rob, I'll let you take it. Okay. Um, thanks, Carl, for getting us started. And thanks to um, both our in person and our online uh, audience. Um, I was inspired to organize this session when I thought about the legend of Norman Borlaug's final words, which were, take it to the farmer. I thought to myself, well, we now have a new crop improvement technique, uh, genome editing. Will genome edited crops be taken to farmers or not? And uh, one way to think about the future of this technology is to look at some evidence from, uh, from the past. Uh, I think recent history tells us that the uptake of, of novel crop uh, seeds by farmers will depend upon at least five critical variables. Uh, the presence or absence of, of acute fears about food shortages, a world food crisis, fears of famine. Number two, levels of public trust in the institutions that have developed and are delivering uh, the technology. Number three, uh, consumer confidence 
in the safety of the foods that will be grown from these seeds. Number four, the presence or absence of active resistance and opposition from, for example, environmental NGOs. And, and five, uh, the ease of detecting uh, the presence of, of these new uh, seeds in commercial channels. These five variables uh, can explain, I believe, why the original Green Revolution seeds were quickly and widely taken up, and why the, the transgenic crop seeds that began appearing in the 1990s were not so widely or quickly uh, taken up. And maybe these variables can also be useful in, in predicting uh, uh, the future of, of gene-edited uh, seeds. Uh, first, one quick shameless self-promotion. I'm drawing uh, this presentation in part from a book that I published last year titled Resetting the Table, a straight talk about the food we grow and eat. And I'll be uh, elaborating on my argument in an essay that's going to be published by IFPRI in 2023. So, Here's my, uh, here's my analytic framework. My five critical variables are listed uh, on the left. And when I review these variables, in the context of the original Green Revolution seeds that were developed and deployed in the 1960s and the 1970s, we can see that the conditions for a rapid and broad uptake of these seeds were optimal across the board. The 1960s was, well, we heard this morning from Samantha Power, it was a, a moment of, of acute uh, anxiety about the adequacy of world food supplies. It was, a, it was actually um, a Malthusian panic. And books like, um, uh, like Population Bomb and Famine 1975 were popular bestsellers. So this was a moment when, when we needed, we knew we needed uh, some technological assistance. Also, because the Green Revolution seeds uh, came from, uh, not from profit-making multinational corporations, but from trusted philanthropic organizations like the Rockefeller Foundation and the, Founds Found and the, and, and, and the Ford Foundation, and they were, they were distributed uh, mostly free of charge or at cost, by national agricultural extension workers. It was, it was not a technology that, uh, these were trusted institutions delivering this technology. Uh, third, uh, the consumers felt safe with these new seeds because they were developed through conventional breeding. There weren't any, any transgenes, no foreign DNA, nothing, nothing terribly uh, novel from their vantage point. Fourth. There wasn't any opposition uh, at first to the Green Revolution seed varieties from environmental organizations uh, because organizations like Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace didn't exist in the 1960s. Those organizations weren't created until 1972. Uh, UNEP didn't yet exist. The Earth had not yet, the Earth Summit in Rio had not yet been held. This was, a, this was uh, an era uh, free uh, from this a serious factor now that can get in the way of the deployment of novel technologies. And, and fifth, uh, these, uh, these novel seeds were hard to uh, identify uh, physically uh, in commercial channels. It, it wasn't easy to, to spot them and out them if you were worried about them. They just looked like seeds. They didn't have they didn't have foreign DNA that expressing new proteins that you could trace back to a genetic engineering process. Okay, uh, a, very different, a very different picture when we look at transgenic GMO seeds that the first, first appeared in the 1990s. By the 1990s, acute food security anxieties had mostly dissipated, in part because the Green Revolution seeds had been so successful. So no more panic about, uh, about the world running out of food and famine. Uh, second, these uh, GMO seeds were, were mostly uh, developed and patented by profit-making multinational corporations uh, who were, uh, to say the least, not trusted uh, as much as private philanthropic foundations 
or, or government uh, agencies. Third, um, these seeds, it was easy to scare consumers about these seeds because they did contain foreign DNA. They were branded frankenfoods. Uh, so consumers were not comfortable uh, with uh, the original transgenic seeds. And fourth, almost from the moment of their appearance, uh, these transgenic seeds were opposed by environmental organizations that launched campaigns uh, against them, uh, describing them as something that would kill monarch butterflies or something that contained terminator genes that one inflammatory charge after another uh, stood in the path of acceptance of these seeds uh, because advocacy groups decided to target them. And fifth, uh, because these seeds did contain uh, transgenes, it was relatively easy to detect their presence. As a result of all of these uh, factors, governments uh, were persuaded to impose highly precautionary regulations on these seeds, including, including tracing, where operators in the food chain were obliged to keep uh, a written record for five years of every GMO that they handled, where it came from, and where it went. This was an audit trail system that was supposed to make it possible to pull these seeds out of the market if something terrible uh, went wrong. Of course, these, uh, these uh, burdensome regulations mostly uh, discouraged farmers from planting them, discouraged food companies from putting them uh, into their products. It mostly drove them out of the marketplace completely. And to the present day, in most countries of the world, it's not yet legal uh, for farmers to plant any GMO varieties of staple food crops such as rice or wheat or potato or, or white maize. So a very different outcome for transgenic GMOs compared to the original Green Revolution seeds. But now the problem arises. What about um, gene-edited crops? What do, the five variety, what do the five variables predict for the future uptake of gene-edited crops, like CRISPR crops? Here we have, um, we have a, a mix of both encouraging and, and discouraging factors. There are two discouraging factors. One of them is encouraging overall, but discouraging for the, ad the adoption of new crops. There is not a sense of acute crisis, acute food shortage around the world. We heard a little bit about a food crisis this morning, but this is nothing compared to, uh, to um, the Malthusian panic that we were experiencing in the late 1960s. I remember the late 1960s. It's nothing like, uh, nothing like today. Uh, this is good overall, but it doesn't make it easier to introduce new agricultural technologies. Second, a second discouraging factor, uh, CRISPR crops did encounter almost immediate opposition from uh, advocacy groups, from environmental NGOs, uh, and, and, and those groups wanted them to be regulated like GMOs. They, they called them GMO 2.0. And uh, sure enough, in 2018, the European court uh, decided that in the European Union, they should be regulated like GMOs with all of the labeling and tracing restrictions that had kept GMO crops out of markets uh, in Europe. But there are also three encouraging factors uh, for these gene-edited crops. CRISPR crops are so much less expensive to, to develop that uh, they didn't have to rely on corporate scientists uh, working for uh, deep-pocketed um, corporations. Um, that's why 90% uh, that's why, uh, of transgenic crops uh, were, uh, were corporate, but only, what, what did you say, 5 or 10%? Oh, Argentina, yeah. So this, is, this technology is not going to be as heavily dominated by profit-making uh, corporations. It's going, to be, it's going to come out of universities. It's going to come out of institutes. It's going to come out of institutions that are far uh, more uh, trusted and trustworthy. And universities, some like Wageningen, have already said that uh, they will share the intellectual property that accompanies these technologies with not-for-profit uh, organizations uh, with a free license. So uh, this, is, this is not the same kind of threatening uh, control by corporations that we saw with transgenic crops. Uh, second, uh, consumers will be hard to frighten because these gene-edited crops don't have uh, 
foreign DNA. It's hard to call them frankenfoods. Uh, also, because there's no foreign DNA to detect, regulators may decide in the end that it's pointless to try to uh, track these things down, police them, and keep them out of the food supply. I don't know how they can possibly do that uh, when you can't easily detect their presence in the food supply. So uh, th this is an interesting mix of encouraging and discouraging factors. We don't know the end of this story yet. Uh, the final outcome will depend on the regulatory decisions that are made by, by separate sovereign governments, uh, especially those that made it hard for transgenic seeds uh, to reach um, farmers. Will they now take a different approach to gene edited crops? Uh, that's the question uh, for this, uh, for this uh, breakout session and the question that our next four panelists are going to address. So now I think I hand it over to Eustace. Yes, uh, thank you, Robert, uh, for this nice introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Justus Wessler. I'm professor for agricultural economics and rural policy at uh, Wageningen University. And uh, what I will do in my 10 minutes talk to enlighten you and inform you about how the situation within Europe regarding the regulation of genome edited crops, animals, and other technologies looks like at this point in time. Before I start with this, uh, I want to highlight why this is such an important issue. Now, uh, we have developed a model together with other colleagues uh, where we describe the innovation process for uh, companies to invest in these new technologies, where they have to spend time and efforts on R&D, on uh, the approval process, they make benefits when uh, crops reach uh, the markets. There might be some ex post liability related to new products being introduced. And if we model this and taking into account that this time length can be uncertain and overlapping, and uh, just do a large Monte Carlo simulation trying to identify average effects, then we got something where we were very concerned about and did not expect. And that is that. Uh, if you look at these coefficients here, for example, this kappa 2 here that is indicating the approval phase. And what this coefficient tells us that if you have one extra year in the approval, the extra benefits you need to basically compensate for this extra cost in the approval phase have to be 73%. So that means a factor of 1.73. One extra unit of uh, approval cost requires 1.73 units of extra benefits. And that illustrates for us economists why these policies, how you organize the approval process from an economic perspective, are so important. So for us, it's important to, to see whether or not the private sector may do it now or postpone and say, wait and see how the situation develops. Now, looking at the European Union, it has be, uh, the approval process has been uh, described as something that is lengthy and costless. Now, when we look at the new gene-edited technologies, they are considered at this point in time under the European legislation as GMOs and they would follow under the GMO uh, policy, which requires that, for example, they have to uh, follow the regulation 2001-18 on the release into the environment, which basically describes uh, that uh, companies that like to submit something for cultivation in the European Union have to provide information that are assessed by the European Food Safety Authority and then the European Food Safety Authority provides a recommendation or an assessment, which is then submitted to the European Commission. They look at this assessment, and then they submit this to what we call the Standing Committee, where all member states of the European Union are pr uh, present, and they vote whether or not they should follow the advice of uh, the recommendation from the European Commission. And, uh, approve in most cases, uh, that is what the European Commission would recommend, uh, either uh, the 
for cultivation, or you can also follow another line that is for import and uh, uh, processing. If the standing committee doesn't reach a qualified majority, either in favor or against, it moves to what we call the appeal committee. And there again, uh, a voting takes place. And if they do not come up with a qualified majority, either against or in favor, then the European Commission can decide. Now here, these are some voting results, and I will uh, show this on the next slide. Never ever a qualified majority, either in favor or against, since 2001 has been reached at European level. That means always the European Commission has decided and the European Commission always decided according to the proposals that they have submitted and which normally was always in favor. So basically in the end they got approval but only for import and processing as from 2001 onwards nothing has been submitted for cultivation. Uh, so it just takes extra time. Okay? Now the um, the EU is aware about this situation, and in particular when the new gene editing uh, uh, pro, uh, technologies have been developed, there was a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, support from stakeholders uh, that the uh, European Union should reassess uh, their policies. And the European Commission did start with this, so they initiated a, a process, and that includes a stakeholder and expert consultation, and a, a proposal for a revised policy for the approval is expected to be developed by the second quarter of 2023. Now, when the European Commission has developed such kind of proposal, then it will be discussed and in the discussion, the Commission will be involved, the Council, which basically uh, represents, in this case, the uh, uh, Secretaries of State that are res uh, responsible for GMOs, as well as the Parliament, and in European Commission uh, words, this is the trilogue uh, discussions. Normally, they take about three years for finalizing a new um, regulation if the things move fast. Now, this is something that is very controversial, so we do not expect that this will move fast. So we expect 23, but most likely uh, 26, but most likely will be 27, 28, when a new uh, proposal will be uh, uh, presented. There is one obstacle, and that is that um, a new proposal has to be uh, voted uh, in f uh, supported by the council and their qualified majority needs to be reached for a change in the current legislation and that seems to be at this point in time when we look at the current positions of the member states in the European Union not feasible to be reached that means everything that we are do that they are doing now might not pass the council meaning to say nothing may change with respect uh, to the regulation now, despite this, uh, there are investigations going on to see what, what, what might be possible. And there's, for example, one uh, project that has been funded by the European Commission, Gene Beacon. Um, I participate in this project, and what we do is, uh, what we do within this project, assessing what are possible alternative regulatory possibilities and how much basically they will cost uh, the companies uh, for getting uh, new products through the pipeline. And we, we have here the status quo that is basically our or a baseline situation and then we compare alternatives and one is using the existing possibilities of the existing current legislation and make it a little bit easier for getting specific uh, GMOs, as I said, new plant breeding technologies are considered uh, GMOs, through this approval process, for example, that the requirements that EFSA has for uh, submitting dossiers might be uh, less demanding, less time-taking, less costly, and then um, that the authoriz uh, authorization uh, will uh, uh, be simply the other thing is then that we have a regulatory uh, relaxation where GMO legislation stays intact for transgenic organisms, so the current status, and then regulatory relaxation for cisgenesis and, and genome-edited plants. And again, then having a simplified author uh, authorization for those, and uh, the authorization would go via a committee procedure where the uh, standing committees might not be involved. Then, 
a somewhat more radical change is that uh, the European uh, Union moves to what we call a product-based approach. It's not based on how the product has been developed, but what are the properties of the product. And that is basically going back to the situation that we had before uh, 1999 when the legislation was changed. And uh, for those who are familiar a little bit, going back to what uh, we call the novel food regulation where GMOs were uh, prior to 1999 being uh, regulated. And then the fifth one is uh, then having only uh, uh, foreign DNA inserted uh, uh, plants uh, being under the GMO directive, and all the other plans uh, would be outside uh, the GMO uh, directive. So these are the five uh, scenarios that we uh, analyze, and they are a result of a stakeholder consultation that has been initiated uh, by a group, Reimagine Europa. They, they talked with several stakeholders, and that, was a, uh, that are the possibilities that they have identified. The European Commission themselves also do an assessment of different options, and they have classified this into three areas, A, B, and C. They have, again, as a baseline, uh, the current situation. And then under uh, uh, possibility A, they have two possibilities, authorization with proportionate risk assessment. So again, the, uh, adjusting the risk assessment depending on what kind of genome editing we are talking about. And then adapted detection uh, method requirements, again, according to the changes. And uh, the second alternative that you have a pre-notification of products that are also obtainable naturally or by conventional breeding. So you just inform you have done this. You not necessarily have to go through an approval process uh, under the current GMO re uh, regulation. Uh, Carl is already uh, um, asking me to speed up. So this is. F I've been nice to you so far. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, this, uh, the B option is then also related to labeling, to what extent those products uh, uh, should be labeled. There might be additional sustainability label required or no labeling if they are considered to be sustainable and then no labeling and traceability if a product is also attainable uh, naturally or um, by conventional breeding and then C is uh, additional sustainability uh, issues um, and that includes uh, incentives for authorization if you have a sustainable new product and uh, sustainability requirements uh, uh, if you fulfill them then you don't need extra uh, authorization so they are currently discussed uh, at the European uh, Commission and uh, well, if you uh, summarize this, so the European Union is aware about these challenges. Um, changing the current regulation will be very difficult. So I, I'm very skeptical, uh, but there might be uh, possibilities to operate within the current system. Uh, changes will take time. Well, the rest of the uh, world will move ahead. And that may then in the end have, uh, to a certain extent, a negative implication for the adoption of these crops in other regions of the world, as long as they would like to trade with the European Union. And with this, I'd like to finish my presentation and hand over to our next speaker, which is Margaret. Thank you very much. Good evening. I hope we are still awake. <laughs> that story from Europe, as uh, it ended, that the rest of the world continues. And I was really hoping that then Africa does not consult Europe. <laughs> yeah. So I'm really excited to be here this afternoon to share with you some of the perspectives and on what is happening in Africa. And I want to thank uh, Professor Palberg for inviting me to serve in this panel. It's just okay. Is that better? Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. And as I got, I got the question or the topic of this panel, will gene-edited crops be kept from farmers? I added in Africa. And I nearly wanted to change that topic so that it's more to do with when 
will genome edited products be available to farmers in Africa? But then uh, I, I paused because uh, the panelists here and the initiators are really seasoned professors. And as a teacher, I know what it means when you try to challenge. As a student, you try to challenge your teacher. Uh, then you may not get it right. So I decided to just go with that question, and this is how I approached it. Uh, the first question that uh, obviously comes to mind is why farmers really need new tools, especially in Africa? And we have a beautiful climate, 24 hours, pests, diseases, everyone. Microorganisms are very, very active, 24 hours, 365 days. And so farmers are have always been very challenged with how best to handle uh, the, the pests and diseases. And just uh, quickly, uh, we have this uh, new fall armyworm that has been affecting corn crop in Africa and most part, parts of the world. But it is more devastating where uh, farmers without any additional tools or new tools to manage this pest continue to pump their crop with a lot of pesticides. Uh, sometimes they just swim into the pesticides and come out. You cannot imagine that uh, you know, farmers will continue to spray more and more harmful chemicals. And so uh, testimonials from farmers, the desperation from, from farmers make it urgent for Africa to adopt new tools. And then, of course, uh, if our farmer uh, for current is uh, the young people, uh, they are more techno salvi they want uh, smart, uh, pleasurable technologies that they can use. They're not going to use the old 1900 technologies. And so we must make sure that we are getting the larger portion of the people who are energetic, who want to be part of the solution to the uh, food insecurity problem in Africa, to do farming. And how do you do that if you don't have new technologies, if you don't move with the times and add on to what they find? Then another very important contributor why we need technologies is because the average farmer in Africa is currently at 65 years of age. And you can imagine if these are the people you expect to use old technologies to feed a burgeoning population, then we really must move faster. And uh, the question I was asking when Wesley was presenting was, oh, yeah. So I think in Europe, then there is no really urgency to add uh, to increase productivity. But for us here, I mean, for, for Africa, we really have that urgency. And so I looked at uh, some of the success factors. What would be some of the success factors uh, in addition to what uh, our uh, first panelist has just talked about, all those factors about trust, about uh, uh, who is developing what. And I think for us, uh, three key components are very important. One is about the products. What products? what crops and what traits uh, is Africa going to champion? The second one is about the regulation. What kind of regulatory systems are we going to adopt? And thirdly, how are we going to communicate, to pass this message about uh, new breeding innovations, genome editing, to our consumers, to our farmers, to our policymakers, and indeed to the whole wide spectrum of actors in the food system in Africa? I put a, a big caveat there that if all these three uh, factors are considered. Uh, we still do know that there will be very man many extraneous uh, variables and factors that we may not be able to control. For example, uh, the, Euro the Europe factor, we cannot ignore it in Africa because we know most of our policymakers have been uh, doing a lot of benchmarking for many other things. And because of that historical relationship we had with, with Europe, uh, we have even seen uh, with gene, gene, uh, gene um, genetic engineering and GM technologies that some of the countries in Africa have adopted the highly precautionary approach that Europe has adopted. So we cannot ignore that among many other factors. So very quickly, uh, looking at the landscape for uh, Africa, we are getting very encouraged by uh, the number of uh, research projects that we've been able to track. And uh, we, we, we provide this service to the global community about you know, what is happening around the world, but more importantly, what is happening in Africa, where I sit and where I live. And we have seen uh, promising 
uh, projects. Of course, some of them are quite small. They are in the universities, they are in uh, uh, research institutions, but one key attribute is that they are focusing on crops that would be considered as food security crops for Africa that may not have received much attention uh, in the 25 years of uh, uh, GM technology. These are crops like banana, cassava, uh, we have the Ethiopian mustard, we have um, uh, maize, you know, corn, uh, sorghum, and even wheat. And this tells us that uh, there is some hope in terms of the products that African researchers are focusing on. Then uh, in terms of um, the, the the challenges that they are focusing on, they cut across uh, diseases, they cut across pests, and also abiotic stresses like drought and flooding. Then and salinity, of course, three things. Then when it comes to the other realm of uh, animals, we are also seeing that the genome editing is progressing uh, through crops and animals. And yesterday, we had about some of the projects that are being undertaken, like the slick cow that is heat tolerant, is very suitable for sub-Saharan Africa, and we hope that these are some of the traits that uh, are going to be uh, uh, to be prioritized by our African governments. We have also seen you know, diseases and low productivity of our animal breeds, chicken, goats, uh, cows and so on, they all have very low productivity. So these are the traits that Africa has been focusing on. Then when it comes to regulation, uh, who are we benchmarking with? I would say that uh, a number of African countries have been uh, moving around and uh, finding out uh, where or how different countries are uh, regulating genome editing uh, products. And uh, one of the countries that a number of um, African countries have been really uh, collaborating with in terms of uh, regulatory uh, approach is uh, Argentina. And Argentina is one of the countries, as we have heard, that was uh, the, the first to develop its uh, uh, regulation, the regulatory guidelines for genome editing. And what uh, uh, the lesson that uh, uh, the African countries that have consorted with Argentina have learned is uh, you know, one is the, the, the type of regulatory approach or the system that you, are, you adopt determines what kind of products, uh, the rate of product delivery. It also determines how many actors can be able to deliver products to, to farmers. And very, very importantly, the kind of entrepreneurial opportunities, both for local uh, private sector and even some foreign companies both large and small. But I think for Argentina, as you can see the figures, they have been able to even document that uh, more than 50% of uh, the, the products that are already in the pipeline are actually coming from local, uh, pri uh, local public and private sector institutions, which is also encouraging because that is exactly what Africa has started with. Then uh, looking at uh, where Africa is uh, out of these consultations, and Argentina is not the only country that uh, African regulators have consulted, but uh, we have three countries now in Africa that have already published uh, guidelines. These are Kenya, uh, Nigeria, I'm happy to see Nigeria here, and uh, Malawi. This, these are the three countries, and uh, one attribute that they have picked is that um, they are going to use a product-based uh, regulatory approach to genome edited products. What that means is instead of looking so much at the process, they're looking at the end product. Does the end product deliver? Uh, is it safe? Is it uh, uh, up to the expectations of uh, the consumers? Then uh, the, what another attribute that is key is that instead of going through a whole process of waiting uh, for the regulator to go through the products, then they have also uh, adopted a pre application uh, process where you can submit your application and then the regulator determines whether your product is going to be regulated as a GMO or it is going to be regulated as a conventional uh, uh, product for breeding. Uh, then the third one is uh, communications and for communications uh, we have had a number of initiatives and I would say that uh, for AISA AfriCenter uh, last year we launched the African Coalition for Communicating about Genome Editing and mainly we are looking at how to frame the narrative for genome editing in Africa so that at least we can see how best to support the products that are already in the pipeline. And so uh, some of the things that we are striving to do differently are one, 
uh, we have realized uh, value, the value and belief system is very key. So trying to understand the stakeholders and their value system, what do they care most about genome editing? Could we be uh, dwelling so much on the process of the product than what they really care about? The, the second attribute is the trust, very, very key, and we have heard about that. Trust is key. In fact, uh, if there is no trust, no matter how much evidence you generate, it does not matter. And the, the, the contrary is also true. If they don't, the, the public doesn't trust you, it doesn't matter what product you, you deliver. And then thirdly is the, the appreciating that there's a knowledge gap because only about 5% of the African population would understand plant or animal breeding. And so we, we've been developing knowledge products so that we can improve on the awareness and sharing with the policymakers so that they can also develop uh, those. And so in conclusion, we would say that uh, we have seen African researchers, both from the universities and research institutions, are focusing on crops, products, and traits that are relevant to Africa in terms of food security, feed security, and indeed um, the drought and the abiotic stresses. Number two, uh, we have seen that a number of countries are already consulting with countries that have, been, uh, that have pioneered in trying to deliver a product, although we have also had, since 2015, Argentina developed the, the regulatory process, but they have not yet delivered. We'll discuss that. Thirdly, and very, very importantly, again, it's about transitioning all these pieces of work that is happening in our research institutions into products. What do we need to do? Where is the private sector, uh, local and international? We need to have concerted effort to have partners that can deliver. Then we also need to, to ensure that we have a social license from our stakeholders so that they can build, we can build on the trust that they have from the public institutions so that we can deliver these products. And for Carl, if you can just allow me to make just three quick asks. Uh, we have developed uh, that booklet where we are looking at Africa's genome editing uh, space and we are encouraging African scientists to continue registering their products or their projects in that booklet so that we can do a lot of uh, you know, matchmaking, coalition building, instead of having small little projects happening in East Africa. Uh, Milton here is focusing on cassava. There's a group in South Africa. There's a group in West Africa. These three can be brought together so that the crop can make a bigger difference and investment becomes easier. Number two, we would like to join, to invite all of you to join the African Coalition on communicating about genome editing. Join us so that we can move together uh, in the continent. And thirdly, uh, we'd like to ask for collaboration. We'll have the African Biennial Biosciences Communication Symposium coming up in, uh, in Kenya in 2023. And again, we'd like to invite partnerships. You, th this will be matchmaking. You'll be having uh, you know, a marketplace where we have all the private sector, the public sector coming together to see how we can move genome editing in Africa. And as I finish, Kenya is one of the countries that has been breaking records of their own. You know, uh, one of our mar marathonians just broke his own record. Uh, is it uh, three months ago or two months? And so I think and I strongly feel that the Bolak dialogue now needs to move from the US and come to Africa. And we are ready to host those dialogues in Africa uh, when it comes next. Thank you. Excuse me. Oops, excuse me. Um, do we, um, okay, our next uh, panelist, uh, next two panelists are uh, supposed to be online, and I'm not sure whether uh, Anjan has showed up. Okay, so, uh, so in a way, this is good, so we can get uh, the next panelist uh, in. Um, so the next speaker is going to be uh, Ji Kun Huang, who has been waiting patiently, I believe, uh, to... Uh, to participate, and he'll be our last speaker, and then we'll uh, spend a little time on some uh, questions. So uh, uh, go ahead, Ji Kun. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, we're, we're having a sound issue, Ji Kun, just a second. Okay, yes. good. Hi, we got you. Can you hear from me? Yes, yes. now we can hear. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Great. 
Hello? Okay, we can hear you, Jikun. Hi. Okay, go ahead. Can you hear from me? Yes, yes. Hello. No one please talk to me. I, could, if anyone can call me, you can hear from me. Yes, we, we can, can hear, hear from you. I don't know. Yes, uh, you are yeah. heard. Can you hear us? Okay. Okay. Uh, can you see? Uh, so, uh, can you see my PPT? Yes, we can see your PowerPoint also. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So go okay. ahead. Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay, my talk also about the gene edit crop be kept away from farmer in China. But before my talk, this answer this question. Let's look at social and cost of growth in China in past four decades. China economy kind of growth and only average at 5.4 percent. The most of this growth comes from TLP growth, called effect productivity growth. But so why are source of TLP growth technology in the way that the major source of growth? But despite this economy kind of production has grown very fast in the past four decades, feed and food import have been increasing over time, particularly particularly in past 15 years. To then or reduce the gap of import uh, export, uh, the past experience in China is has largely dependent on technology. Technology is key to improve China productivity and food security. Therefore, China has significantly increasing across to R&D investment in past two decades, and this red line showed the total account of ID investment in account ID uh, compared to the blue line of US total account of ID spending. And this growth comes from both public, private sector and public, public sector. Indeed, on biotechnology, growth in, in account of biotechnology ID also has growing very, very fast. Even, even faster than, than, than total account of ID investment. I want to make a note of here. In the 14th five year plan, uh, among many technology development, genes and biotechnology has been considered as key technology development in the coming five years. This including genomic research, application, genetic breeding, synthetic biology, and others in a cultural sector. Because China considers biotech is uh, one of major tools to boost a kind of productivity. productivity. But then I come to back question whether gene added uh, crop be used by farming in the future in China because uh, when, when there was low regulation in gene specific crop uh, one year ago, but in Brazil, that's under GMO, the configuration is same as GMO crop in China. So let's first review GMO crop experience in past in China. My own understanding is if product, GMO product, or gene product, anything, any product, uh, used by farmer, there are four conditions. One condition is technology should be ready. Here is of the, so you made the GMO crop which was already 10 years ago in China. Uh, second is they receive safety production certificate okay, from government. And from experience in China, we see all these GMO crop developed in China by Chinese scientists in China, in by public sector and private sector, they all receive safety production certificate almost the same year they take it already. But this is only two conditions. The other two conditions is for a condition that technology has to meet national strategy need. Yeah. Uh, food and so a full security. Last but not least, it, the benefit from this technology from commercialization to meet national strategy demand should be greater than public concern. So within four conditions, <coughs> We see the, the, this in the case of the cotton papaya, they have visited this 
uh, for convincing the labor immediate commercialized for culture in 1997, Papaya in 2006, because we now need technology production work, not only decrease, they might get out of the business. But this is not the case for tomato, uh, no, tomato, sweet pepper, but there's a low market demand for that. BT rice is not uh, letting straight demand because China in past 15 years there has been oversupply of rice. By now, uh, a grain stock, rice stock is more than total production in, in the whole year. A fight is not increasing productivity, so that is uh, making food security. Uh, it's a kind of food security, so we are not expecting have not been commercialized. But we saw the, the, the demand for government from, from China because uh, to meeting uh, reducing food uh, import. Uh, but in general, in past 20 years, imports and cars of commodity have, do, have been increasing, but that is more think, uh, accessible for the commodity and it needs to be here. Uh, but the situation changed for May last year. Importantly, suddenly increasing, in reaching nearly 30 million metric ton because of uh, demand of uh, recovery of livestock production in China. But more important is the import of soybean. Now, import, uh, in many years, imports reach about 100 million tons. So the question is why we do not adopt this GMO technology? Because technology is not ready uh, before for BT. Maize in the herbicide tolerant in the maize, that technology derived by Chinese scientists, company, and government by power sector was ready only by 2018. Indeed, only delayed by two years, China issued a uh, safety production and certificate for BT maize. And so, being in two years ago, this kind of more or less ready immediately. Can be easy to save the product of scale for this product. But of course, it's need to technology, need national strategy, need years because you saw already import our maize, so it be increasing so, so much over time and huge inquiry now yeah, from uh, China, from the rest of the world. <laughs> and uh, we, I expect, need, of course, need to look now already in farm field, uh, it's more scale for. For panel project, and I believe next year, a huge amount of farmers going to adopt technology because they need BT made and so uh, uh, soybean they make for criteria. I just said that uh, the technology already done by Chinese scientists, they already receive safety certificate, they meet national strategy, strategy demand, and they, they need benefit in morning consumer public concern. Now, come back to how progressive in gene editing technology. As I mentioned earlier, China also has invested huge uh, investment in gene editing in, in biotechnology. If you look at the scientific research, in terms of paper, China just uh, behind the US. Yeah. But this is data by 2018. I believe the, the, the difference between China and US is in the declining over time. But if you look at the technology uh, in terms of patent, again, China also ranked the second in the world, just uh, slightly behind the U.S. But I want to know that this is, uh, of course, we are much behind in medical science, but uh, medical application. But in agricultural application, China indeed, uh, we uh, have used leaching technology for many crop, livestock, fishery, uh, anyway, more than the case is more in U.S. and U.S., which needs better ground, and, uh, and because uh, before this year, gene editing crop um, also suffers same regulation as a GMO. They have go through or they regulation, regulation covers research, experience, production, processing, marketing, trade. So they have to meet the same requirement as a GMO. But I saw, as I saw you earlier, if they made the four condition and they made the particular made national strategy demand for technology, they will be used by farmers. 
and let the uh, uh, regulation by end of last year. But most important things in January of this year, Minister Ikato and Uno Affair issued a trial regulation which is in editing plan. Why trial? Because it's in not ready or, or no, they are almost ready. So we use trial regulation. So even even the in editing container for DNA is in editing, they, they come back to this regulation. But if no foreign DNA is inserted in the crop, no, then the two questions to invite does the environment safety risk is the food safety risk? If you know, when you take a company provide data, so there's no, no, this kind of risk, you can skip all environment regulation, go to the regular safety certificate. If yes, they, they can, we go to similar process of GMO, but it will require much less data and then, uh, go through much faster than the GMO or, or regulation process process. So let me make a, a couple of few final conclusion. Um, first, China has invested significantly in biotechnology. The progress has been made in both GMO and gene editing crop. In the past period so that as long as the technology is generated by in China already and they are ready and they can meet the national strategic demand uh, and, and uh, yeah, they are unlikely to be can be quickly commercialized. We expect the Chinese farmer will benefit from gene editing crops so if the technology are ready. I mean it's not ready, but I, I believe in the coming year it's going to be ready and it can meet the national strategy to need and I, I think that there's literally go, definitely going to improve a productivity and food security, which are the key concern of government. And of course, it means consumer demand. Thank you very much. I will end it here. Carl. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Jikun. So um, I, I think um, uh, to go back to the, to the um, original questions we had, I, I guess I'm still wondering, and maybe the, the panelists could give me their few views, and then, then I'd like to uh, have some, some uh, discussion from you, is <clears throat> whether, you know, if, if, we, uh, if, if these regulations were all uh, easy to get through and in place, I mean, do you think that, that there are technologies that would be in the field in Africa or Europe or, or elsewhere uh, you know, in the next year or so, do, are we, uh, uh, do we have technology that's really ready? Um, Margaret, do you, uh, wh what do you see in terms of the, the research that's going on? Um, you know, is, is there stuff that's ready to go out into the field? Yeah, very good question. Uh, for those of you who may, who listen to Samantha Power this morning, she did mention that uh, there is a project that is now already being funded by U.S. Can you hear? You have to, uh, uh, Hello. what do you? Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, okay. okay. I think I was just been, yeah. Yeah, so I was just mentioning about the project that was mentioned this morning uh, by Samantha Power. That's about uh, developing striger resistant sorghum. It's going by striger smart sorghum for Africa. And uh, we believe uh, that project in the next three years should be able to deliver some lines that can be multiplied by farmers. So I think uh, going by what the Kenyan regulator has advised, that they're going to be more interested in a product-based approach. Uh, we are going to do uh, very soon a uh, pre-application uh, consultative process so that we can be guided on uh, what process the products are going to be regulated under. And, uh, all signs are that it will be regulated as a conventional product. And we are careful not to say that it will not be regulated. It will be regulated as a conventional product. And the other regulators that regulate seed are also informed, and we are going to make sure that we are moving together. So yes, I would say that. There is another one, uh, the maize leather necrosis uh, disease, maize corn, uh, that is being done by the Kenya Agricultural 
and Livestock Research Organization. That is also another product where the proof of concept has already been done. Uh, they've already been doing a lot of tests, and these are the two crops that we think in the next uh, three years, being very, very uh, optimistic that uh, we can get lines that can now go to the national performance trials and our seed sector can start multiplying. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know, uh, Eustace, or, uh, I mean, I guess, well, yeah, Eustace. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I think um, in, in the livestock sector, the, uh, there mm. we may see uh, soon that if the regulatory environment uh, will not prohibitive there, uh, where products will reach a market, basically they are already under development, the mm -hmm. uh, PSRV um, resistant uh, pork and uh, other developments in the livestock industry like for uh, female uh, uh, chicken, uh, these developments are almost there. Mm -hmm. In the crop sector, I'm a little bit more, more skeptical in the sense that uh, these uh, developments still will also take their time. Right. And, and when we have these new uh, varieties being uh, developed, you still, or the technology being developed, you still have to breed this in, into the uh, local varieties, etc. These standard things need, need to be done. So we shouldn't be over optimistic in a sense, and we say, okay, in one or two years we will see something on the market. There I would be a little bit more careful. But definitely there's a lot of research going on. Mm -hmm. There will be new uh, developments uh, reaching uh, the market, but we shouldn't press too much and then say next year or in, in two years. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there I would be a little bit more careful. Um, I don't know, Jikun, do you have some, some favorites that are, uh, that um, varieties and things like that that you think are going to uh, come quickly now that these uh, are, you know, when these regulations are, are sorted out? I mean, you've got the regulatory framework, but it's not clear that the regulators are ready to, to take applications yet. Is that right? Yeah. My, my, my view is, is uh, which current uh, more positive movement in ponies in terms of both are in the investment in the editing and uh, on our government uh, now it's uh, moving to look at uh, this regulation and more uh, positively and uh, we see more maids as so we been going to now. It's better going to not going to adopt by farmer next year. I, I believe uh, I think editing crop will also be ready, not of course not within a couple of years, I think uh, uh, in the coming few, few years, uh, mm -hmm. to be uh, able, farmer may be able to adopt some of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. no, Rob, do you want to add to No. Okay, so uh, let me. Uh, um, uh, open the, the uh, floor for questions. I, I gather that we have time to, to do this as we wish. Um, so, uh, Kareem, do you want to, uh, let's see, we've got a microphone over there. Yeah. Thank you for the excellent presentations. Uh, so, along with the regulatory approval, Put it up, yeah. oh, can you hear now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Very good. Yeah, this is a very promising technology. So along with the regulatory approval, I'm just curious from the panel, are there intellectual property issues? Because that's one of the things that also yeah. roadblocks for technologies moving to farmers uh, with the genome editing. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, maybe I'll, I, I'll, I'll start, give a, a little bit of an overview. I mean, certainly the... Um, uh, you know, the, the basic patents in terms of, of the CRISPR technology uh, seem now to be available, um, you know, from MIT, Broad Institute, and, and, uh, and um, from uh, Berkeley uh, on a non-exclusive basis, pretty much. I mean, you have to have the money to, to pay, but, uh, but it's on, available on a non-exclusive basis. And, uh, uh, but then, uh, some of the, uh, I'm, I'm not as uh, familiar with, you know, some of the other, the traits and things like that and what kind of, uh, of um, uh, patents and, and intellectual property rights are, are involved in that. I, do you have any, anybody else have any sense of what the IPR situation is? Yeah, so for the Stragasmat Sogam, 
we have incorporated one other partners, the, the African Agricultural Technology Foundation, uh, that is going to negotiate and uh, get, uh, hopefully, a license, a humanitarian license to use the the first uh, the first uh, constructs, but after that, Kenyatta University and Addis Ababa University, which are the main institutions involved, are already working on developing new constructs that are going to be uh, freely available. But again, uh, the issue of intellectual pro property is very important because we also want to encourage our public sector to also uh, start benefiting from the innovations that are coming out of the universities. But there is already an arrangement on the partners that we're going to use to ensure that we don't infringe on any intellectual property rights of others. So AATF is, is going to license in things that are needed for that project? Is that what you're saying? So, or, uh, so AATF is mainly going to, to be involved in the negotiation for the universities to own. Oh, for the universities yes. to own these yeah. trades. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So that they can now use the uh, private seed company and startups that are also going to be mm -hmm. a component of that project to see how best we can develop a seed sector that is also driven by our young people who are graduating from the universities but they don't have right. anything to do. Uh, Eustace, yes. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, I think Robert has already mentioned that uh, the, uh, these new technologies will open up a far wider range of applications. And, and Jennifer Doudna was talking in this context, democratization of science. So for many companies, now uh, the cost for developing new products will be much cheaper. Now the experience that we have with uh, the, the property rights is like, what, what, Karl, what you have mentioned, that Broad Institute, uh, in collaboration with the other institutes there, uh, uh, Berkeley, as well as Wageningen University, many have decided that they make uh, these technologies free available, in some cases for no cost, depending on how you apply this, in other cases under licensing agreements. So basically it's not becoming a stumbling block as it might have been uh, with the previous uh, uh, GMO uh, traditional uh, technologies. Rob? Uh, I agree with that. Uh, I'm not sure that intellectual property claims patents in wealthy countries were ever a serious stumbling block in the way of crop development, even transgenic crop development, in the developing world. Uh, whenever the companies were asked to uh, to share their technology uh, on a royalty-free basis for humanitarian purposes, whether it was in, in the Golden Rice Project or in the various <coughs> Gates Foundation projects in Africa. They did it. The, the, the stumbling block was resistance in the developing world to the technology and the, the timid approach that governments had towards something that had been so heavily stigmatized. The Rockefeller Foundation, at the outset of the transgenic crop revolution, was frightened to death that this technology would be, would be trapped in rich countries and poor countries would be desperate to get it and they wouldn't be able to get it. It turned out that that was exactly wrong. The developing countries were so frightened away from this technology that they wanted to keep it out. They didn't want to bring it in. I don't think it was ever intellectual property claims that were a stumbling block to transgenic crops. And, the, and of course, the, the, other, the other issue that I, I haven't looked in very carefully, but the, you know, it, there's going to be some some challenges patenting. I, I mean, you know, in <clears throat> many cases, you're trying to make these claims that that the things that you're you're producing are are um, you know they're they're sort of natural. They would have been developed through yes. uh, you know through uh, regular plant breeding and things of that sort. Um, I, I'm not sure how easy it's going to be to uh, to patent some of these these traits. I mean, on the one hand, you're saying, okay, this is just like the other stuff. And then on the other hand, you're, you're patenting it and saying, no, it's completely different somehow, you know, that we've engineered it or we've done something. So it seems like there can maybe a little bit of a, of a, a challenge there for companies also. Um, let's see, you, I think, did you have a question still? Or, and then I'll, I'll come back to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah just um, thank you so much for the presentations. And uh, mm -hmm. my name is Richard Mark Mbaram. Um, I work for a, com a company called Agro Nigeria. 
Uh, and in recent times, you know, we've uh, had a, a bit of a consortium uh, projecting Agro-Africa. Um, I, I do agree with you um, that the core of the challenge for Africa is different from, you know, other uh, geopolitical um, or geoeconomic, uh, global geoeconomic, um, you know, regions because of the need, you know, factor. Um, so, so, so my question would be uh, in the nature of a statement. Um, a typical African farmer who is resorting to um, pesticides to keep away Maruka vit um, vitrata, for instance, from cowpea, um, ends up really exposing the populace you know, to a more um, profound problem of uh, poisoning, basically, and then ex increases the um, health budget, uh, ultimately, of the country and dwindles the productivity of the workforce. Uh, you know, so, so Africa has a more profound uh, exposure. Um, and if we're able to really painstakingly appraise the situation, we would know that, uh, you know, regulation um, and um, legal uh, 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 regula regulation might not necessarily solve the problem for us in the near term. We are in the 65s that you were talking about. Uh, I don't know which of, uh, yes, it was the gentleman. You know, we're in the years of, we're in the 1965s right now. Uh, and so the same approach uh, that was adopted then is what we need in Africa. Radical, broad-based, you know, emphatic, you know, approach. Uh, and an engagement with the farmers, with policymakers, businesses, broad-based is what we need, you know. And so it brings be, me to the question. Intervention with the, by the public sector, you're saying. Yeah. Th that's yes. correct. And, and not just seeds, irrigation. The um, whole nine yeah. yards. Yeah. The whole Storage, nine yards. Like veterinary you, medicine. Like you guys say in the U.S., the whole freaking nine yards. <laughs> you know. um, so, so, so the question now is, um, how do we tailor make our solutions on the continent of Africa you know, to meet our needs and how do we co-opt you guys to support us in, 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 that, in that undertaking? That, that's, that's my question. A, a modest challenge for us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anybody wants to take that on right now or not. Why don't we uh, take the next, uh, yeah. next uh, yeah. question? Yeah. I, you know, we've been involved with um, actually looking at the biosafety issues of both GM as well as gene edited crops. I'm uh, KB Raman and I'm based at Cornell University with Global Development. <clears throat> and uh, we've been working with many, many developing countries. And I think, you know, there are a number of issues which come to the forefront. One is the precautionary principle which is being used in Europe, which was very well illustrated by the speaker from Wageningen University. And the other one, was the product-based, science-based regulation which U.S. as well as the North American region is following. And then we have these tremendous investments from both partners, Europe as well as North America, in terms of building regulatory capacity within the developing world. You can take Asia, you can take Latin America, you can take uh, Africa. So Africa, Majority of the countries are a big, and I think the speaker from Wageningen illustrated in his slide, is a global sort of export, import hub for many of the products which come in from the region. So when it comes to building capacity within these committees, and then you look at the framework of each of these committees, who are the members in this committee? You know, you have social scientists, you have representatives from the NGO community, you have scientists, you have food safety experts, you have economists, I mean a whole range of them. Now, all of them 
are either trained either in Europe through the precautionary principle or they are trained in North America based on the product-based principle. So what happens when they get back? Then they have to address some of the you know, issues which our gentleman from China presented, you know, looking at the local needs. And you were mentioning about the Maruka problem. You, and you, know, you mentioned about Striga issue. People, the committees, I mean, there's no harmonized regulations. <clears throat> you know, that's where I think the whole confusion is being generated. I mean, I don't want to blame the <laughs> Europeans here, but you know, the picture which you presented, and you indicated that in the near future, in Europe, the picture is very bleak. And that in itself has a tremendous impact, whether we like it or not. Because you're a major it's a trading block. Yes. So what we need to strive as a community is, can Africa have its own harmonized regulations as a region? Instead of, you know, Ethiopia following its own regulations. And, you know, when I looked at the chart of Africa, there are only three countries. Nigeria, BT Kaupi has been commercialized. I mean, you talked about Striga. Even though the regulations are there, the material is out, there's no seed production. Who's going to multiply this seed? Who's going to make it available? So there are all these, you know, when we talk of making these products available to the farmers, all these challenges come into play. So it's not an easy fix. It's not the whole seven yards, which our <laughs> colleague mentioned here. It's a very, very complex changing scenario. And on top of that, even though you know, our, our speakers mentioned that the cost for developing these products is considerably low, I agree with it, but when you start adding the biosafety operational expenses for just the committee members, mm -hmm. if somebody does an economic analysis, you would just, it's just unbelievable. And you know, ministries don't have this kind of money to really even promote committees. You know, committees have to be brought here, they have to be taken back, capacity has to be developed. So on and on, you know, this, this thing goes on, but uh, I'll probably, you know, try to <laughs> figure out if there's any solutions to some of these issues. Um, yeah, Rob, you wanna respond first? And then yeah, I'll, I'll say something very briefly about the, about the precautionary principle in Europe, uh, it, it strikes me that Europe did not become prosperous and well-fed by adopting the precautionary principle. Uh, agricultural science was invented in Europe, and they used it. They didn't uh, wait until some committee said it was okay. Uh, the, the extreme form of the precautionary principle is never do anything for the first time, uh, which, which doesn't work. And, and even today, even Europe today does not follow that as a principle. When it comes to, for example, smartphones, uh, Europeans didn't keep them off the market until every uncertainty had been resolved through elaborate research, until every component had been approved by a community-wide committee. These were so obviously useful to Europeans that the precautionary principles, it was just pushed aside. When they, when they saw GMO crops, they said, oh, well, uh, our farmers are already prosperous without them. We're already well fed without them. Our farmers don't even grow a lot of soybeans or cotton. Um, so even the slightest anxiety is enough to keep them off the market. I, that's not a principle. That's, that's some kind of curated convenience. Uh, so I don't, think, I don't think it should be a model for others to follow. Uh, let me add on, on that one. Um, I think we have to be uh, very uh, careful when we look at the uh, precautionary uh, principle, and we have to differentiate between what is called in the literature a precautionary approach. Now, the principle, at least in, in the European setting, is a legal principle. And basically, it applies uh, or it allows the lawmaker to intervene into the market um, and uh, to uh, establish additional regulations that 
Well, that would not uh, necessarily be there otherwise. And we have this in uh, the EU regulations for, for many, many years. So that allows basically the European Commission to become active. Now, the second, so that I think no, uh, nobody would be against this. You have this in the United States, uh, you have USDA, uh, you have FDA, they look into new products, etc. The, 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 where we uh, have different, uh, where there's disagreement is about how do you then implement this, basically? How do you apply this? And I think the uh, United States perhaps have chosen a somewhat better way uh, to address uh, the challenges with new technologies in the food and uh, agriculture than, than uh, what, what Europe uh, has chosen. But the, the, the whole change came at the end of the uh, 1990s, before the GMO regulation, so to say, or the approval was under the, uh, what is called the novel food uh, regulation. And then in the late 1990s, there were a number of food scandals in the European Union that did include the mad cow disease, that uh, did include HIV-tainted blood uh, sold in France, <laughs> Uh, it did include uh, um, some uh, uh, food safety issues related, uh, or uh, not, not, it was not a safety issue one, uh, uh, food issues related with soft drinks. And at that point in time, then uh, Europeans be became a little bit concerned, okay, now you tell us that the GMOs are safe while you were failing on all these other <laughs> issues. And that was then mm -hmm. the start where, the, uh, where member states were asking, okay, we want to have a specific regulation for the GMOs. And then it was at the same time uh, when Serra, uh, not Serralini, there was a push die came up with this rat study, which was quite controversial. When uh, the uh, study on the monarch butterfly came up, so that came all together at the, within half a year. It was almost within half a year. And that initiated then the change in the regulation. And the problem was that they were doing this very quickly, right, with a hot pen, and were not really thinking through. That was the fastest change in regulation, as far as I know, that we have observed. It was done within less than three years, right, going through all these different steps that I did laying out before. And I think the mo and that result was not very satisfying, right? But as I said, the, it's a legal principle. So that allows the government to intervene. It does not necessarily require that you have to stick to this. Normally, uh, also according to the uh, uh, Treaty of Lisbon, the European Commission has to reassess uh, uh, the regulations. This is often not done in a serious way. <coughs> and that is another complaint. But coming back to you, to Africa, I think Africa should work on a harmonized regulation, also for the internal markets to simplify yeah. everything. Hey, and on that, let me just uh, do one quick intervention. I mean, the, the, you know, we, we, we get again tangled up in, oh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a mess, and we're never going to get out of this mess. But I mean, maybe we should take a look at, I mean, at, in, in China and in, in perhaps now in, in, you know, in Kenya, okay. we, we are having major changes because there's major pressure by the politicians and there's, in some cases, opportunities by the private sector to, to push ahead. And I mean, it, it seems like that demand side thing, it, you know, can change policies in, you know, and can change regulations if, they're, if, if these things are, are uh, really needed. So, so, you know, maybe it's really needed and maybe, it, maybe we don't really have technology, no, you know, proven technology that anybody really wants to to use in terms of, of gene editing. I mean, it's like I, I come back to this basic issue, is gene editing really gonna help us out all that much, you know? And, uh, and um, so. It's a little piece, the contribution. <laughs> exactly. It's definitely it's, not the silver right. bullet, that's right. as that's we right. always say, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. But when you look at the possibilities to apply this, not only in the agricultural sector, yeah. in the whole bio, uh, economy sector, including biomedicine, the medical sector, in, including refinement of biological resources for other purposes and food, feed, and fiber. It's so widely, can be so widely applied, and uh, the regulatory environment is, is one of the important issues or uh, instruments either to enable or 
to reduce uh, the possibilities. Yeah. yeah, Carl, I wanted to I, say something. Okay, this is going to be our last right. comment, and then the <laughs> hardcore that still <laughs> stayed with us all this time, we'll, we will yeah. release you. Yeah, <laughs> on the issue of harmonization, uh, this has been discussed a lot, and we do have some initiatives like the Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa, COMESA, uh, that looked at all the 19 member states, but driven by trade, because trade disruptions are real. If you have one country that has different uh, trade requirements, then it becomes very difficult, even for conventional products. Exactly. But what we have found for uh, biotechnology and biosafety regulations, harmonization uh, is still you know, not taken very, um, is not very welcome in terms of having a continental regulatory guideline because the countries in Africa, we have 54, mem is it 55 now? 55 member states and these countries are at very different levels in terms of research, in terms of needs, in terms of development. In fact, there are some countries in Africa whose priorities may not just be uh, genome editing for now or even modern biotech or tools because they have other means of feeding themselves. But uh, there is um, an opportunity, especially when countries are working together on a trait, a crop, and a system which is of interest to two or three countries. So you can start, you need to start from smaller communities like the coalition of the willing to work together, not necessarily to harmonize, but to collaborate. And that way you're able to identify which areas in your regulatory uh, you know, guideline is making it difficult for the three of us, for example, three countries to deliver this product. And so you work on that and three countries get together, they have similar, more or less regulatory system. Then you have another three countries, but going continental is still going to be very problematic because once they get to the Africa Union level, one country there would say, that's not my priority, and yet, yet you have this guideline. And then there is also this issue of sovereignty that each country, no matter what, even when you talk about a harmonized uh, regulation, we still have the sovereign right as a country to make a decision on what we want. And for this case, this is what Kenya has done. Our president has seen, you know, there are so many challenges, and he is a scientist himself. And so he feels that this is the way to go because uh, we need food for 4.5 million Kenyans that are hungry, that are starving. We have thousands of livestock dying because of drought, because of many other factors. And so it will take, again, political goodwill for countries to again agree, Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, or Kenya, Tanzania, can we come together and build on our a system that works for us. So there are so many mix of things that we need to consider, and not just uh, the committee itself. Sometimes it's even the regulatory agencies within a country. You'll find the uh, Minister of Health has a, a regulatory agency that sits in the committee. We have Minister of Environment, another committee. And so when they get together, it is becoming extremely difficult, compounded by public participation, another big elephant, another animal that you'll never know which is a critical mass of public that you need to consult and agree on a decision. So there are many factors, but I think uh, we still want to remain uh, optimistic that uh, we still go ahead. And uh, I believe, like uh, my brother here says, we have to really be radical in the way we predict technologies for Africa. Okay, that's the, the last word. Uh, uh, semi-optimistic uh, view of, of going <laughs> forward, right? Um, so let me uh, first thank uh, Ji Kun for waking up in the middle of the night to, uh, to <laughs> join us. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you to Margaret in particular for fighting her way through the U.S. regulatory <laughs> visa <laughs> system and making it here. At uh, least next and, time it will be in Africa, so no problem. We'll yeah. make it easy. <laughs> and then thanks to the other panelists and, and particularly Rob for, for getting us started on this, uh, this, this whole idea. We hope to, to put this together maybe into at least a, some kind of summary paper perhaps that we can, can uh, make as a, uh, something, you know, lessons from this. And, uh, and, and who knows, maybe we'll all go to uh, 
at uh, Nairobi and, and uh, join Margaret's meetings uh, in the yeah. next year. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, the one other thing that I, I blew it uh, completely, <laughs> and now it's, now it's back to the hardcore, so, um, is, is that uh, I wanted to uh, announce, you know, and let people know that we are having the, our ICABR meeting, the International Consortium for Applied Bioeconomy Research. It's going to be talking about a lot of some of these, these same issues in Argentina, where all the action seems to be happening on some of this stuff. Uh, I guess Argentina is making up for a weak research system with a, a flexible regulatory system, perhaps. Uh, don't tell my friends that I said that. Um, and, uh, um, but uh, that's going to be in June next year, uh, July, July next year, July. 1st of July next year. And uh, so we hope that um, if you have any interest, why well, you can come down. You can talk to us right now. Eustace is our president. Um, and uh, so we, we invite you to, to come to that. And we'll definitely have some sessions on, on uh, you know, the whole uh, gene editing issue and its importance and the regulatory system for it. So, so thanks you. Thanks to the to our our uh, technicians in back that uh, kept us going. And um, so we all uh, hope to to discuss this further outside or over beer or whatever it is. And, and uh, thanks again for for coming. Thank you.